Hey guys, it's Mike Rowe. This is The Way I Heard It, the only podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span. It's episode number 157, and this one's called A Novel Hero. A Novel Hero. A title inspired subliminally, perhaps, or subconsciously by the novel Coronavirus, which you may have heard of. <laughs> You've heard of the novel Coronavirus, right? It's uh, crept into the headlines the last couple of months or so. Uh, dominating the headlines, one might say, dominating our lives. As I talk to you now in the 55th or 56th day of my own personal sequestration, how's it going for you? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to resist the temptation to bring you up to speed with all of the things in my life that have been unfolding for the last couple of weeks. I don't know why I feel so compelled to share it with you. Many of you have asked me for an update on this and that. This isn't the kind of podcast that typically does this, but I do confess um, it is an overwhelming temptation. So rather than vomit up all of my uh, thoughts and observations regarding what's going on in the world right now in front of the story I'm about to share with you, I will do so after the story <laughs> in the way I talked about, the way I heard it. So for those of you who tune in mostly to listen to these fabulous short mysteries, carefully curated for the curious mind with a short attention span, I'll get to it directly. And for those of you somewhat interested in the musings and free associations of yours truly with regard to all things corona and the uh, little things going on in my own personal world, well, stick around. And I'll talk about that after the tale. It is the true story, incidentally, of a novel hero, and it's brought to you by my friends over at Lightstream. Thank you, Lightstream, for being a loyal sponsor to this podcast in these uncertain times. One thing is for sure in uncertain times, money is getting very, 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 very tight. And if your credit is decent or better than decent, the odds are really good you're paying too much interest on your credit card. If you have a few credit cards and you maintain uh, a balance, you should really think about refinancing your debt with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. I don't talk casually about debt. Those of you who know this podcast and me personally know that I am opposed to it with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns, which is why it pains me, especially in times like these, to learn that so many people are paying so much unnecessary interest on their cards. 5.95% APR with auto pay. That is is as low as the rate can go with Lightstream. Much lower than the national average credit card rate, which right now I believe is over 19% APR. There are no fees with Lightstream. Everything is done online. It takes just a few minutes. 100% online. You can get your money as soon as the day you apply. You can start saving money immediately. Thousands of dollars in many cases over the course of a year. Bottom line, Lightstream believes people with good credit deserve a better loan experience. That's exactly what they deliver, and that's why I am proud to speak on their behalf. Today, get a special interest rate discount. Save even more if you are a listener of this podcast, which you clearly are, since you're still listening, for which I am grateful. Lightstream.com slash row. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash row. That's the only way to get the added discount. Lightstream.com slash row. Subject to credit approval. Rate includes 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply. Offers are subject to change without notice. Visit Lightstream.com slash row for more info. As you know, that's the disclaimer. I have no choice but to read that. But I don't have to speak on behalf of Lightstream. You know, I'm not obligated to. I'm doing it because I genuinely believe they can save many thousands of people, many millions of dollars. Perhaps you'll be among them. Having said all that, this is the way I heard it. The true story of a novel hero. Ellen was 26 years old on the day of the accident. Chuck was 53. The unlikely couple sat next to each other in the first-class carriage, holding hands beneath the coat that lay between them. Chuck was engrossed in his novel, as usual, as Ellen watched the English countryside roll by. Neither imagined their love would be put to the test two minutes from now. Ellen glanced at Chuck and sighed. 
A talented actress herself, she'd fallen the moment she'd seen him take the stage eight years ago. She was only 17 then, and completely mesmerized by the way Chuck could hold an audience in the palm of his hand. But beyond his talent on stage, Chuck possessed another quality that Ellen admired even more, a heroic quality, a quality that made her feel safe in his presence, a quality that would be in great demand 90 seconds from now. Sitting across from Ellen and Chuck was Ellen's mother, Frances. Unlike Ellen, Frances saw nothing heroic about Chuck, nothing at all. What kind of hero would pursue a girl half his age? Francis recalled a line uttered by one of Chuck's most popular characters, a line he often repeated on stage in the course of his popular one-man shows. I was too cowardly to do what I knew to be right and too cowardly to avoid doing what I knew to be wrong. Was Chuck himself a coward, a man too afraid to do the right thing? Francis was about to find out 60 seconds from now. Outside, a signalman jumped up and down on the side of the tracks, frantically waving a red flag. Francis paid him no mind. Neither did Chuck, who was still engrossed in his novel. The engineer noticed, however, and quickly applied the brakes. Unfortunately, a train traveling at 50 miles an hour needs at least a mile to come to a full stop, and tender locomotive 109 was already half a mile from the bridge in Staplehurst, a bridge that was currently undergoing maintenance. And so, at exactly 3.13 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, the doomed train approached the Staplehurst Bridge at roughly 25 miles an hour. Then it ran out of track and plunged into a ravine. The chaos was unimaginable. Passengers screamed in terror as their cars were dragged off the bridge, one after the next. Witnesses later testified that the pileup appeared to unfold in slow motion as each carriage fell onto the one before it, crushing the occupants. One car, however, was spared. By some miracle, it teetered on the precipice, partly in midair, partly on the bridge. Inside were Chuck, Ellen, Francis, and a few dozen other first-class passengers, all in various stages of panic, all but one. Chuck, no longer engrossed in his novel, instructed everyone inside to hold still and remain calm. Then he opened the carriage door and stepped out onto the running board. Below him were a dozen smashed carriages and the screams of those trapped inside. Slowly, he crept along the narrow running board to the back of the carriage. There, a gap roughly six feet wide separated him from solid ground. Chuck knew his carriage might tumble into the gully at any moment. So, he backed up as far as he could and bolted toward the gap, leaping over the yawning chasm to solid ground. He then ran from the site of the accident, confirming Francis's worst assumptions. But only for a moment. Chuck returned to the teetering carriage with a long plank of wood. He placed the plank across the gap and carefully walked across it, re-entering the car. First, he summoned Ellen and led his love to safety. Then he returned for Francis, whose opinion of Chuck was rapidly improving. Once they were safe, Chuck returned to the carriage again and again, escorting women and children down the narrow running board, across the plank, and out of harm's way. Finally, when everyone was safely on solid ground, Chuck turned to Ellen and kissed her on the forehead. Stay with your mother, darling. There's work to be done below. Before he descended into the ravine, Chuck returned to the teetering carriage one final time, to retrieve his top hat, a flask of whiskey, and, of course, his novel. Then he scrambled down the embankment and walked in to a nightmare. The injured were everywhere, moaning in agony and calling for help. Chuck offered whiskey to the wounded and dying. He scooped water from the stream, which he dispensed from his top hat. Several of the victims died in his arms, 
but Chuck remained on the scene for hours, doing what he could to be of use. Ten people died that day, and 40 others were seriously injured, including Chuck, who developed PTSD long before it had a name. So unnerving was his experience at Staplehurst, he was unable to speak for two weeks after the accident. He also developed a debilitating case of siderodromophobia, a fear of riding on trains that plagued him for the rest of his life. And yet, in spite of the national press surrounding the accident and the very public inquiry into the cause of the wreck, no one wrote about Chuck's heroism. Why? Because that's the way Chuck wanted it. He fled the scene of the accident before the press arrived. He then beseeched the Southern Railway Company to remove his name from the passenger manifest, which they did. They were so grateful for Chuck's assistance in the aftermath of the wreck, they agreed to pretend he was never on that train. You see, Chuck was not the kind of hero who wanted any recognition. He was, instead, the kind of hero with a wife at home and ten children. A wife who had no idea her husband was on a train with a woman half his age. Not until his death, five years to the day after the deadly derailment at Staplehurst, did Chuck's gallantry come to light, along with the details of his scandalous affair with an actress named Ellen Turnin. And when the truth came out, as the truth so often does, the good people of Victorian England were no longer sure how to feel about their national treasure. Some condemned him, obviously, while others simply refused to believe a man who had so frequently captured the nobility of the human spirit was capable of such a rank betrayal. Many, though, lovers of literature in particular, praised his heroic decision to rescue not just his young lover, his prospective mother-in-law, and a few dozen fellow travelers, but the novel in which he was so completely engrossed at the time of the wreck. Not the novel he was reading, the novel he was writing. The last novel he would ever write. It was entitled, Our Mutual Friend, and like his 14 previous bestsellers, this one was packed with a cast of rich and complicated characters. Characters he brought to life not just on the page, but on the stage with his popular live readings. Colorful characters like Madame Defarge and Sissy Jupe. Craven characters like Uriah Heep and Bill Sykes. Tragic characters like Mrs. Havisham and Rosa Dartle and most of all, imperfect characters like Fagin, Ebenezer, and of course, Pip, the flawed hero from Great Expectations, who famously said, I was too cowardly to do what I knew to be right, and too cowardly to avoid doing what I knew to be wrong. A telling turn of phrase, penned by a famous writer who left the world a collection of unforgettable heroes. Heroes every bit as human as he, a novel hero named Charles Dickens. Anyway, that's the way I heard it. Well, good for Chuck. When the chips were down, he did the right thing. He acted like a hero, a novel hero in this case, but a hero nevertheless, a human hero with feet of clay and flaws and foibles. But that's okay. Who among us is not festooned with a foible or two? This is the way I talked about, the way I heard it, the only spontaneous analysis of the only podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span wherein I attempt to explain the circumstances that led to the writing of the tale you just heard. In this case, I think it began a couple of weeks ago when I was sitting in this very chair where my butt is still quarantined, and was waiting to zoom in to one of those morning shows where I was going to be interviewed about, uh, well, I was going to plug my mother's book, which, by the way, thank you, those of you who purchased about your father and other celebrities I have known have helped my sweet.